Cash Flow Diary Podcast, Episode 427. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cash Flow Diary Podcast, the podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leveraged streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cash Flow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow game, Jay Massey. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Cash Flow Diary Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Massey, and I'm glad that you're here today because here's what I know. What I know about you is that you are on this journey, this journey to build the cash flow, whether you're at zero or you're at seven figures. It doesn't matter. You're still building. And here's one of the things that you're going to encounter on this journey. Well, we all know that our journey starts out with great excitement, right? And everything is fine so long as I don't experience an obstacle. We can keep going. But what happens when you experience an obstacle? More importantly, an obstacle so large that you think, oh my God, I'm never going to be able to come over that one. Well, I have with me today someone who I think will be able to help you see that obstacles of all kinds, can be absolutely overcome. Not just overcome, but you can learn to not just survive, but also thrive as well. I have with me today none other than Janine Shepard. She's a former Olympic skier turned pilot, which you know, guys, I get excited about. And her career as an athlete ended when she suffered a life-threatening injury when hit by a truck during a training bike ride. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never been hit by a truck. You got to understand, one of the things that we hold dear, all of us as humans, is health and our ability to go out there and make things happen, even more so if you're an athlete. So if you've ever experienced a setback, downturn, and was wondering, can I do it? Do I have what's inside? I think today's guest is going to be there to help you. In fact, she's wrote a book about it, Defiant. A broken body is not a broken person, and you may even be familiar with her from her TED Talk, same title. So let's welcome and listen, Janine Shepard. Janine, you there? Yes, I am. Hi, Jay. It's a pleasure to be talking to you. I am excited that you are here. Would you like to know why? Oh, well, firstly, maybe it's got something to do with flying. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. It I does. didn't know that you wanted to fly, but that's cool. I do desire to one day have uh, my own pilot's license. Uh, I have flown an airplane once briefly when I was uh, over the skies in Belize, but it's on your website. It says speaker, author, change agent, and it's the change agent that I absolutely appreciate. It tells me that you have a purpose, and I think we're going to change people today. What do you think? Oh, absolutely, and and but they have to want to change. Let's get that right. I agree. <laughs> Let's get that straight. You can't force someone to do something, um, but I think that hopefully when they hear my story, uh, that will give them the inspiration to uh, make the change in their life to, you know, head them in the right direction. Excellent. Excellent. So let's get started. So this being your first time here, I have to ask you the same question that I tend to ask everybody the first time that they're here. Are you ready? Mm. Yes. All right. I tend to look at today's entrepreneurs a lot like yesterday's superheroes. You know, Batman, Robin, <laughs> Wonder Woman, etc. And I think entrepreneurs and superheroes have a ton of things in common, chief among them occasionally. As an entrepreneur, we can envision ourselves as flying through the sky and maybe we're wearing capes and tights and saving our customers from themselves using our products and services. But also, like a superhero, an entrepreneur has a beginning. So if you think about Spider-Man, for example, there was a time where he was just a regular kid going to school, trying to get good grades, and taking some photos for the newspaper, trying to make sure he had some lunch money. And then one day he gets bit by a spider and discovers that he's got a newfound superhero ability that he gets to choose to use for good or evil. And we all know he chooses good. So my question to you is as follows. What we want to know is before the Olympics were even on the horizon, before the pilot, 
obviously before the accidents, before the book, before the TED Talks, before all of the things that people know you for today, who is Janine Shepard? Hmm. Well, that's a great question. <laughs> uh, I was uh, a tomboy. Awesome. I started my athletic career at the age of probably around six or seven. Mm. And let me tell you my superpower back then. Oh, okay. <laughs> my superpower back then, and I would say this is a superpower that has saved my life, is I learned to love the hills. The hills? Mm. Like a mountain? Probably wondering. Yeah, well, you're probably wondering what that means. <laughs> yeah. And I always say to people when I speak, when I'm out there on, on stage, I always say, okay, you know, for people – and the listeners here, I'm sure everyone either they might go jogging or they might be walkers. They might have a preference to go walking. And so I say, well, you know, if you go out for your morning ride or, you know, walk, run, do you take the flat or do you take the hills? And invariably people always come back and go, oh, the flats. We love the flats. And I say, ha-ha, <laughs> that's what needs to change. Mm. Because when I was very young, uh, just intuitively I discovered when I – was training with my athletic friends that we would go out and we would be running on the flat and we'd get to a hill and everybody would complain. <laughs> Nobody liked the hills. Mm. And I thought to myself, aha, uh -huh, this is my edge. This is where I can make a difference. Uh, because if I can learn to love the hills, then it's not just going to make me physically stronger, which it did. It would make me mentally tough. Mm. And I learnt, uh, you know, and it's a great, you know, superpower. <laughs> so it did. I always trained on the hills and it earned me a nickname uh, from my fellow teammates of Janine the Machine, which <laughs> not only rhymes, <laughs> but I thought that was pretty cool. Janine, and, and they used to call me Machine, Machine, because whenever we got to the hills, I would just put my head down and I would actually go harder. I won a lot of races on the hills. Interesting. That was where I... You know, that was where I actually won. And that was my edge. Yeah. So that's a superpower, loving the hills. Got it. Got it. I, I get this. I like I like where you're headed with that. So, and you said that started at what age? <laughs> oh, six or seven. Where, very early on. Wow. And you know, the things, you know, Jay, that I learned about the hills are not just, you know, that it, make me, it made me physically strong. It made me mentally tough. But one of the interesting things about loving the hills is this, is that you re recognize that the hills never stop. Mm. There's always another hill, right? Yeah. And that's okay because once you accept that life has hills, then the fact that life has hills doesn't matter anymore. Got it. Got it. That's interesting because – this I, I think we're going to be talking about this metaphor all the way through <laughs> because I can yeah. hear where where this is coming from. So take us on this uh, journey, which clearly involves some hills. How do we go from you know yeah. running to Olympic skier? Because mm -hmm. last time I checked, Australia's not really known for skiing. I ever... <laughs> yeah, I know. You're like, what? You have snow there? Yeah, we do. <laughs> and uh, back in my day, of course, we hadn't won any Olympic medals for skiing, but we have now for various winter sports. And I mean, again, that's just, it's like the four minute mile, isn't it? Like Bannister, right. you know, it's impossible till someone does it and then everyone does it. So, you know, I guess, you know, obviously Australia is, is thought of as not a winter sports country, but no. we actually have great <laughs> Great conditions for cross country skiing. We have we have medalists now. We've had gold medalists in moguls, um, aerial skiing, uh, speed skating. You know various sports. Of course, you know it was tough back in my, my day because you know I, you know I was going to be the, the Roger Bannister. I was going to be the one that won the first medal and showed the world that an Aussie could ski. So I had uh, obviously, as I said, started very young, six or seven little athletic. So I was a track and field athlete and then got into other sports. I got into triathlons, marathon running, and eventually cross-country skiing, which is the ultimate endurance sport. Mm. So my goal was to not just, you know, represent my country at the Olympics, but to put Australia on the map as a force to be reckoned with in winter sports. And I had been overseas skiing and racing, and I got on really well with the Canadian ski team and 
the coach, Marty Hall, had said to me, you know, I really believe in you. I, you know, I think you can do this. So come and join up with our team and use our facilities hmm. in the lead up to the 88 Winter Olympics in Calgary. <laughs> wow. You know, wow. that was just an incredible, not just a compliment, but a great opportunity. So that's where I found myself um, headed for the 88 Winter Olympics in Calgary when you... something happened that changed my life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Before we go there, though, uh, I'm just going back to loving the hills again. I mean, you you mm-hmm. went from <laughs> you go straight to a yeah. sport that is all about hills. All of a sudden, oh. it, it yes that that had to carry over to give you yet another strategic, if not you know, uh, physical advantage because of you know, just that mindset from the age of seven. By the way, your parents are awesome. Uh, if that <laughs> <laughs> so, it, it's like. Wow, that I I wouldn't think that naturally, but when you go, because well, the first thing I think about when skiing is, oh God, it's cold, and then there's a hill. But you're you're like, yes, give me that, bring me that thing that you consider to be difficult, and you will go conquer that mountain. How much did mm-hmm. that help you? Is that part of why skiing appealed to you in any way, shape, or form? Yeah, it was tough, you know, and it was. Uh, we had just changed over actually from with cross country skiing to what they call a classical technique where you, um, you know, you can imagine that sort of style when you think of cross country skiing, where someone's sort of running, mm-hmm. um, that's, that's why I describe it with wax. And so they'd grip to the snow to what we call a freestyle skating technique. And with that, you put a glide wax on the bottom of your ski and it was a grunt, you know, you really had to get up that hill in a in a skating technique which was hard you needed to be super fit super strong and for me it was like perfect this was just exactly what I wanted make the harder the better and it sort of leveled the playing field too because technique with a classic technique where the Scandinavian countries really um you know ruled the world this sort of brought everyone back to a um level playing field where everybody was starting at the same level, which is everybody was starting with having to learn how to, how to skate. So this was for me, this, uh, you know, I was coming into it at just the right time and, you know, it just, and I was built for, you know, built for cross country skiing. Mm. I was very strong and, you know, it just, it, it seemed to me like the start, you know, the planets were aligning and, you know, I was going to do something great in this sport. And yeah, I was so focused, so dedicated, nothing was going to stop me. Well, and, and I think a lot of entrepreneurs that are listening right now, or would be entrepreneurs that are listening, they can relate to, to that emotion, to that feeling of when that idea is beginning to take shape and that, that future is like looking in front of you you're like man i can't believe it all of these tools they're right here in front of me i'm in your mm. case i'm training with the the canadian team this is not supposed to happen but it's happening to me and i am perfectly designed for this i think a number of people can relate to that uh, euphoric feeling if you will of the future is going to only go one direction but yet as mm. we know that that's not always what life has in store for us. So tell us a little bit about exactly what happened so that people can all understand uh, exactly uh, what you've been through. Yeah. So um, setting the scene, as, as I've said, and as you've um, learned about me, I was completely focused and dedicated to the point of almost exclusion. You know, it was very much one track. I'm going to the Olympics. Nothing's important. And, and you know, most, most athletes at that level have to be very sort of self-centered and driven to get where they're going, which I was. So I was, uh, I'd come back to Australia after skiing and racing and making preparations to go and join the Canadian team in the lead up to the Olympics. I was on a training bike ride with my teammates a combination of uh, fellow skiing teammates and also um, a cycling group that I used to cycle with uh, during off training, off season training. So riding from Sydney to uh, west of Sydney to an area we call the Blue Mountains, and it was about a six hour ride, something we did uh, frequently a couple of times a year with this group. So we'd been on our bikes for around uh, five and a half hours, and we got to the part of the ride that I loved. And what was that, Jay? <laughs> <What> Probably <laughs> a really big hill. Going it up. It was, it, <laughs> yes, and because I loved the hills, right? And, you know, so I I was actually um, 
I had leading up to this, I'd actually been over training. So I was pretty tired that day, but you know, I rallied, you know, here I was at the Hills, my favorite part of the ride, got up off the seat of my bike. And I just, my last memory was looking up into the bright sun shining down on my face. And then everything went black. Mm. Wow. That's Mm. wow. What was the next memory? Oh, a long time later, I have to say I had, uh, well, I had been hit by a speeding truck mm. and I had extensive and life-threatening injuries. So for 10 days, so I was, I can tell you sort of what happened to my body and, and then what happened to me. Um, I was uh, taken to a hospital and flown by rescue helicopter down to a spinal unit in Sydney. Mm extensive and life-threatening injuries. You know, I'd broken my neck and my back in six places, five ribs on my left side, my collarbone, my right arm, bones in my feet, head injuries, internal injuries. Lost uh, around about five litres of blood, which is all someone my size would actually hold. And so the helicopter arrived at Prince Henry Hospital and my blood pressure was 40 over nothing. Whoa. Yeah, so I wasn't supposed to survive. Uh, I had what I call a death experience. It wasn't a near death experience. It was a death experience. So it's very difficult to t- to talk about because it's it took me a long time, and still I don't really understand it. But for ten days in intensive care, while well, the doctor said to my parents, "She's you know just prepare for the worst. We can't do any 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 more for her." Um, I was in another dimension, mm. um, and it, it it was a place of awareness where I knew that my body was broken. I also knew that I didn't want to return to my body and it took me 10 days <laughs> and after 10 days, for reasons I'm not completely sure about, uh, I did return to my body. Wow. Okay. Now you made a distinction, which I want to make sure that people hear because this is key. You said you could tell us what happened to your body and you could say what happened to you. And I think for a lot of people, when something they're not expecting, because I'm just going to go with you weren't expecting that, um, yeah. <laughs> it happens. When something like that happens, we we collapse the two uh, as one big event and, and in some different way. But you're making a distinction that I believe played a very strong role in your recovery. Can you help understand why that distinction might be necessary? Well, you know, that... That distinction comes in much later on when I when I talk about my TED talk, which I sure. have to tell you that I, I originally called that, um, I'm, you know, you're not your body. So that was happening to my body, but, you know, consciousness lives outside our body. And the, the easiest way to describe this is that, um, you know, the consciousness had left my body and I had an awareness very clearly of, have, of being able to make a choice to return to my body. Hmm. Um, and that choice, you know, people often ask me, Are you sh- was, that a, was that a choice? And I say, yes, it was. Um, I, you know, I was guided in this experience. And even though I was encouraged <laughs> to return to my hmm. body, I didn't have to. I could have said no, but I did return. And... You know, I I briefly touch on this experience in my book, Defiant, um, Mm -hmm. very, very briefly. But I don't talk at length about it because I don't think that that's the most important part of my story. You know, (laughs) the important part is what happened when I did return. Yes, and we were getting to that. But before we talk about what happened, Mm -hmm. I want to know why you chose to return because there is a reason. There was, and at first I didn't know. You know, at first I would say that, you know, I – later on you know knew that and understood that my parents had been sitting by my bedside mm. the whole time that I was in intensive care holding my hand willing me to stay and in many ways I feel that that was an anchor mm. to my body but what I can say now is that this was an opportunity mm. an, an incredible opportunity because before my accident I was an athlete. I defined myself by my body. That was my strength. That's who I was. For me, the greatest um, incentive to learn not just who I was, but who I wasn't, (laughs) 
would be to lose the thing that I thought defined who I was, mm. which was my body. Mm -hmm. So that was, um, for me, the thing that pushed me into the search, into what I call my, you know, the spiritual journey, the journey inside to understand who I really was. And this is what I'm going to call your superhero moment. Because this is that moment, just like Peter Parker gets bit by the spider, and he's got to now make a choice. <laughs> You've yeah. been bit by a completely different type of spider, but you you have a similar choice in, in front of you. There are people who make completely different choices after things like this to them than what you did. So tell us about some of those choices that you've decided to make, and and more importantly, uh, how, how that's played out and into you redefining who you are, and more importantly, the good you've been able to do inside uh, the world today. Hey guys, thanks for listening as always, and I'm glad that you continue to support with each and every download and subscription and share. One of the things that I want to ask you, though, is where are you listening to me from right now? I know some of you, maybe you're on a treadmill, maybe you're washing dishes, maybe you're walking that dog, and some of you are actually in a vehicle driving right now. One of the fun things that you can do, get some of your time back, is begin to living a car-free existence. But even then, it can be a little complicated. So one of the things that I want you to do is I want you to go over to Zipcar. Go to joinzipcar.com forward slash cash flow diary. It's a way that I am able to still go get a car just for a few hours very, very simply so that if I have a lot of errands to run and sheets to drop off and running to the short term rentals or if I just want to go for a long trip up to LA and back, etc., I can rent a car for a very, very short period of time. And the cool part is I don't even have to pay for any gas. Again, go to joinzipcar.com forward slash cash flow diary. Well, you know, when I chose to come back to my body, it was um, it was a choice. It was an overwhelming choice because I was coming back to a broken body and a life um, of disability. Well, yes. So, I mean, you were th that's the thing I'm sitting here thinking about. You're an athlete used to uh, relating to life, everything. A certain way. You, if you're making this choice, you <laughs> the the hill in front of you is probably the biggest one you've ever seen. Oh my gosh! You know, and so when I woke up, of course, the the bleeding had stopped. And they told my parents, "Well, okay, well the bleeding stopped. The next concern was whether she would walk again because I was paralyzed from the waist down." So I spent almost uh, – well, I had major spinal surgery. So the neck break was a stable fracture. The back was completely crushed. I had what's called a comminuted fracture. So if you can imagine for those listening who might know a little bit about anatomy, the lumbar uh, part of my back, L1, was completely crushed, didn't exist oh. anymore. So they had to go in. They really cut me across, opened me up um, and took out two of my broken ribs and they rebuilt my back. Wow. So – yeah, and then they used um, ribs as a splint on either side, and they didn't know how that would turn out. They didn't know, um, you know, how well that would fuse or how much damage was already done to my spinal cord. So I spent almost six months in the spinal ward and got out in a wheelchair. I couldn't walk, covered in a plaster body cast attached to a catheter bottle, and I was told – you know, I remember it very clearly. Um, I, I had no idea. I thought, no, 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 they're wrong. I'm going to the Olympics. This is <laughs> it's going to be fine. <laughs> and I remember the doctor saying to me, you know, very matter of factly, Janine, you know, I think I think that's a little unrealistic. She said, you, you, your uh, da the damage is permanent. Your injuries are permanent. And I can remember her saying, you will never be able to do the things you did before. Wow. And you know. Jay, I left hospital and I was still convinced, no, they're, they're wrong. And, you know, I, it wasn't until I got home and I had a pretty significant meeting in a doctor's office at home uh, where I realized that, you know, maybe maybe I'm wrong. You know, have, have I been kidding myself? You know, it doesn't matter how much I'm trying to move my legs, I can't move them. And I got very, very depressed. Mm -hmm. And to the point of thinking I made a mistake coming mm. back to my body. Mm -hmm. I really did. You know, I don't want to be here. This is not my life. This is not what I've worked all my life for. And I felt like a prisoner in, in someone else's body. Yeah. 
and you know I, I'm I, as I'm listening to you, I, I know there's a number of people who are like D- that's exactly how I feel every time I go to work uh, de- <laughs> depressed I made a mistake or that person who struck out you know said I'm gonna go make a business and they started and they've cut some ties and then it feels really really soul crushingly hard maybe I was wrong maybe I was maybe I made the wrong choice but yet we 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 know how y- your story obviously doesn't end there and neither does yours those of you who are listening right now who might feel like that that's the case so what came into your existence to allow you to to exit that we'll call that low moment well i can tell you you know you you hear a lot of people talk about the dark night of the soul or rock bottom and boy i can tell you that there was one night there after i'd been to now i'm going to tell you a personal story um, I was wheeled into a rehab doctor's office mm-hmm. in my wheelchair, mm-hmm. and uh, this is a male doctor I'd never seen before. After I'd got home from hospital, my mother took me to a new hospital, and he said to me, he looked at me, and he said, right, <laughs> he said, let's talk about your sex life. And I was a 24-year-old woman, he a 50-something-year-old man, and I was very embarrassed. And I remember him looking at me and saying, you know what, it's, you know, someone with spinal cord injury, it's tough, we need to talk about this. He said, you'll know you'll never have the big O again. (laughs) (laughs) Seriously. I (laughs) was just horrified. And that pushed me over the edge. I remember I just sort of Hmm. held back my tears. I remember going home and thinking, I have lost everything, not just, you know, all of my dreams and hopes, but... Um, now he's put into question my ability to be a woman and I just thought what if I got left and Mm. I remember that was about as low as I think I've ever been right and here's the thing about rock bottom I tell people is that rock bottom doesn't show you who you are it shows you who you're not Mm. you very clearly get to look into the depths of your soul and you ask, you have to be willing to do this because it's a very confronting place to go to. You ask the question, well, who am I? You know, I had lost my body. If I'm not that, who am I? Hmm. And why am I here? Yeah. I mean, those are great questions and I I think it's a question that we often skip until we're placed into a situation in which we have no choice but to answer that question so Mm. in in that go go ahead go ahead yeah sorry and you only you only get there when you're willing to go you have to it's not the it's it's not about rearranging the externals it's about rearranging the internals and you have to be willing to go there well and what i like about it is that you there's this situation when you are willing to answer that question, who am I? Uh, you get to now make conscious, intentional decisions about those answers if you're willing to, to face it. So I guess then the question I need to ask you is, who are you, Janine? <laughs> I'm not my body. Yeah. That's what I learned. I learned, okay, you know, I've lost everything. I, this is not you know this this is not who i am i saw this glimpse of something inside that was still there yes you know it was still there even though i had lost my body the ability to walk to use the bathroom to be a woman to all of the things that they'd said i'd lost there was something inside me that said but you you are still there yeah you know just search inside you know that that defiant spirit is alive and that was a thing that really changed my life and you know also that you know I realized I recognized okay it was like I gave myself a pep talk (laughs) you you know you you love the hills yeah and I decided then right then in the you know the very dark night of the soul on my bedroom floor <laughs> i actually had a, a a little prayer that i said into the darkness and it went like this it said you know god show me a way uh out of this or show me a way through this and i think that that you know almost was like a cry 
to that part of me that had made the decision to come back. Hmm. Show me. Show me another way of living my life. And so from there, we go from the ground to the sky. (laughs) We did. And, you know, I say that that, you know, we can sometimes hold on to our life so tightly. The things that we think define who we are. For me, it was my body. For other people, it could be, you know, a relationship, um, their finances, their job, their home, their car, you know. And if we tie our sense of worth to those things outside of us, we're doomed for failure because anything can be taken from us. But the one thing that we can never lose which is our defiant human spirit. And that realization changed my life. And, you know, you've got to be willing, you know, I love, you know, I'm a great fan of Joseph Campbell, you know, the mythologist, you know, you've got to be willing to let go of the person you are or the life you have to get the life that's waiting for you. And often in life, you know, it's this sort of dance, you know, between sort of holding on, loosening our grip, holding on, loosening our grip. And Sometimes life, you know, and that's why I, I'm such a fan of, you know, being able to sit in silence and have that time where you listen to the intuitive self, the higher self, to know when when that time comes, you know. And I basically that night said, okay, I let go of my dream of the Olympics, of, you know, defining myself by my body, of all of that, and show me another way. And that opened me up it was like opening my eyes to another way of not just being in the world but seeing in the world it's it's almost like you you gained an an additional superpower i would say (laughs) in that particular moment yeah yeah new eyes to see and you've made many conscious decisions since then to be able to use this power for good so describe for us if you will the some of the things that you've been able to do post recovery (laughs) well you know when I left hospital my self-esteem had taken such a dive you know I was in a wheelchair I couldn't walk I had to learn to use a catheter you know I mean it was it was just it was tough it was really hard and so when I let go I mean the moment that what happened to me was it was like I had a clean slate okay now what else is available in this world what are the possibilities are available and open to me and sitting outside in my wheelchair and my plaster body cast an airplane flew over and you know I sort of looked up and in this completely crazy moment I thought hmm, okay well I can't walk but maybe I can fly <laughs> <laughs> just so you know in the back of my head the song I believe I can fly is running right now when you when you're saying this it's like it's just it's awesome I love it keep going though I know and you know I didn't know there's a song um is it Mary, what's her name? I I can't remember the the artist because, I mean, I didn't even know this song existed, but there's a song that is called If I Can't Walk or Why Walk When You Can Fly. Do you know that song? (laughs) I do not. Seriously, I'm sure it was written for me. That's awesome. Yeah. Wow. So I, you know, I sort of remember turning to mum and saying, you know, mum, I I think I'm going to learn to fly. And, you know, it was like, oh, that's nice. (laughs) And everyone thought it was crazy. But. The seed was planted. So weeks later, uh, in my plaster body cast, my mum and my friend drove me out to the local airport. They carried me into the flying school. Wow. And, and they took one look at me and thought, uh, uh, who is Why this? are you here? <laughs> exactly. Uh, right. Sorry, the hospital's down the road. And, you know, I said, I, you know, I'm here for my flight. And I, I had booked in for what's called a, a TIFF, a trial instructional flight. I believe in America you call it a discovery flight. So they took me down, drove me down, lifted me into the air, a light aircraft. Now, I had never, ever wanted to learn to fly in my life. Mm. It, you know, it was never on my radar. They lifted me into the airplane and it was just overwhelming. I was like, oh, my goodness. And I remember the instructor taking off that day and, you know, the wheels lifting off the off the runway and it was just the most exquisite feeling. It was just joyful you know, and the instructor let me fly that day with my hands. I couldn't move my legs. And it was just this incredible, you know, I mean, there's no greater metaphor for freedom than flying. 
and from being paralyzed in a spinal ward to I'm flying an aeroplane. <laughs> watch, <laughs> watch me, you know, and it was incredible. And at that moment, I thought, I'm going to do this. I'm going to learn to fly. Yeah. And OK, so let, let, let's fast forward a bit. And I just want to make sure because I know for me, these moments, uh, you know, you when you go through something that you've like what you've been through, you can feel like, OK, I've I've I can check off all the bad stuff that's ever going to happen to me. And I'm done <laughs> with that. So clearly now that you are, you know, you're in the airplane, you're going through this process, you're learning, you know, to fly like literally learning to fly <laughs> nothing bad has happened since then right uh, <laughs> <laughs> didn't you don't you remember jay i told you the hills never stop <laughs> exactly that's exactly what i wanted to you to talk yeah. about that's exactly what i was yeah. talking about the hills yeah. never stop so even though yeah. you've gone through difficult stuff even though we go through difficult stuff we don't get just one hill the hills never stop so what happens uh, and next? let me tell you the magic the magic happens on the other side of the hill so uh, you know that for for everyone listening oh, well i did i learned to fly of course i didn't even know if i'd pass a medical then so we're going to fast forward um i went on i i continued to fly that gave me the inspiration i was then it was what i call I, it was like igniting my pilot my pilot light <laughs> you know i was oh my god i can do this so that gave me the motivation to get out of bed every day every day i got out of bed i, I got my training diary out. I started writing. I started exercising at that stage. At first, I could just lie on the ground and lift my legs probably an inch off the ground. Mm. Practice my walking, and you know, I went from two people, did, you know, being held up to walking around the house, the furniture, um, to eventually being able to walk on my own. My plaster cast was replaced by a metal brace on my mm. back. And all the time, I, you know, my mum would drive me out to the airport and I would go flying with the instructor and he would do the legs, the rudder pedals, I would do the hands until my legs were strong enough to be able to just, you know, reach and use the pedals. And I eventually got what's called my restricted license. Mm. Then I learned to navigate, flew around Australia with friends, got my unrestricted and then I'm going to fast forward because there's a lot of story here um, and I write about that too in my book. You know, I eventually went on and got my commercial pilot's license, Wow. my night rating, my twin engine rating, my instrument rating, <laughs> my instructor rating. <laughs> and then I found myself – I even think, well, how did I do this? This is extraordinary. Then I found myself working, given a job at the same place I went for that first flight. Mm working as a flying instructor, teaching other people how to fly in around 18 months after I'd left the spinal ward. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So again, loving the hills. Got it. Yeah. And let me <laughs> tell you, I'm, and I'm, I'm still a paraplegic. I'm a walking paraplegic. So I did all of that while I have no feeling in my legs, <laughs> while I had to learn to catheter, while I had to have medication. I did all of that. Because, you know, there was nothing stopping me. There was this pilot light, this defiant spirit inside of me that was burning so bright, nothing could stop me. Wow. That, uh, yeah. Okay. Just remove <laughs> excuses while you're at it. But keep going. <laughs> keep going. This is, this is yeah. awesome. But, uh, I mean, I guess what it comes down to is you were still that person. That you're, This is that Olympian coming out in a completely different way because it was inside of you from the beginning loving the hill. You don't really care what kind of hills in front of you. You're just going to go conquer it. Yeah. You know, I realized that I recognized that I'd made a choice to come back to the, my body as we all have, but I'm very aware of that choice. And so I'm not going to waste a moment of this precious gift that I've been given. Well, what's also interesting to me is that getting back to normal wasn't enough. You yeah. wanted beyond that. And sometimes we can be so low, like zero would be great. <laughs> like if I could just yeah. get back well, there, that'd be awesome. I know. And Jay, the interesting thing is, you know, I did it in many ways. I sort of felt like I had a lot of things to prove to all the people, the naysayers that right. said I wouldn't do it, you know. But, you know, in all honesty, the only person I had to prove anything to was myself. Right. Right. Yeah, told, and I, I think that's true for everybody. Uh, it, it just takes interesting circumstances to for us to even come close to to realizing that. So, uh, mm. what happens next? 
Well, you know, there I was in this completely new life that, you know, if someone had said to me earlier, you, you're you going to have to live a life without your sport, I would have thought, no, no way, that was right. who I was. So I'd found this sense of incredible achievement, but joy also in in having, you know, reinvented my life, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that's the interesting thing. That's a really interesting word because, you know, often we hold on to things and we think that's, no, that's the life I want. And, you know, it doesn't matter what we can, what we lose in life. And, and, and life is about stages. You know, you can go through life, you go through young adulthood and, um, you know, even approaching middle age, you know, you life changes all the time. Life is about change and, you know, change is actually a great thing. You know, it's a, it, I say it's nature's way of, you know, often improving, making things better and often we don't like change. But here I was, I had experienced this overwhelming change and found that, wow, this is great. You know, not only have I learned so much about myself, but what I'm capable of. I've created this new life, which I love. I'd learned this new skill. Um, and it was extraordinary. And then, of course, I decided that I'd write a book about it. And again, once again, I wrote this book for myself. My first book in Australia. So I've, I've written many books in Australia, but my first book I called Never Tell Me Never because I thought that was, you know, everyone had said, you'll never do this, you'll never do that. And of course, that again, then launched me into this new career, which was, you know, being on the speaking circuit and, uh, you know, writing my journey and, and, and that again, uh, opened me up to, to so much, to a bigger story, I say, that we can get so stuck in our small story, mm -hmm. why, why me? This shouldn't be happening to me. And when I wrote my first book, um, of course, in Australia, it became an instant bestseller and 60 Minutes did a story. And eventually, um, it was turned into a movie. So in Australia, my story has been made into a movie. And then people, I was just, it sort of opened this floodgate of people reaching out to me with their stories. And mm. what that did for me was took me out of my small story and into a bigger human story where I realized that I wasn't the only one going through this. That has been a tremendous part of my healing. Now, when you say never tell me never, what are some of the other nevers that you were told that you've since gone on to accomplish? Well, of course, you know, that I would never live, that I would never walk, that I would never be able to do the things I did before. Um, you know, oh, that I would never have children, <laughs> never have children. <laughs> I'm the mother of I'm the mother of three. So, and here's the interesting thing about now that's that. a big hill, by the way. <laughs> yeah, that's a big, big one, particularly because I'm a woman with a disability. Um, so, you know, I have three incredible, very compassionate, empathic children. So, I I actually love it. I think it's a gift, actually, when someone says you'll never do something because, you know. You think you're proving, obviously, as I said, you think you've got something to prove to them, but only to yourself. And that's, you know, I say, you know, live a, don't set anyone else, don't let anyone else set limitations. You know, create your own life and decide what you can and you can't do. Because often, you know, we listen to what other people um, say that is possible for our lives. And, uh, you know, we need to really just stay really focused on, you know, on, on our own authentic path. Yeah. Here, here's what I know. There's more to your story than we have time for. Yeah, <laughs> this is, yeah it's a pretty big story. I'm just story. like, <laughs> I, I'm like, we could keep going and going and I can see why it be, can be a movie really easily. It, I mean, even the movie probably left out parts that were important because <laughs> they just had to. There's so much here. So, yeah. we, uh, and with that being said, we, we know that you've got a book out. Definitely want to make sure that those who want to either, you know, find out more about what you're up to and or just pick up a copy of the book, what's going to be the best way for them to connect more with your story? Well, I, you know, I just love um, hearing other people's stories and, and connecting with people. They can go to my website, janineshepherd.com, and uh, Defiant is available there with Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Um, I'm also on, you know, Twitter and um, Facebook and those uh, Instagram, I have to say, that's a new thing for me. <laughs> but, um, you know, I would say for anyone, so my other books have been, you know, periods of my life. Defiant brings people up to date with where I am now. And it's, the, you know, I'm I, another great thing is that 
I, you know, I packed up. I had a, more and more hills and setbacks in my life. And three years ago, I, uh, after my TED Talk, I had received a, 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 an email from a man in India, of all places. And he'd said to me, uh, you know, I've had an ailment for 19 years. And he said it was so bad that I was thinking about suicide. He said, but I saw your talk today and my life starts now. He said, pray for me. And that was this wow. seminal moment where I thought, oh, my gosh, I have – I can't, you know, I've, I've got to spread my wings. And I'd suffered more setbacks in my life, which I write about, and I won't go into that now. And so I did what anyone would do. <laughs> I gave everything away. I packed my bags and I moved across the world. <laughs> <laughs> of course, that makes perfect <laughs> Why sense. Why not? And um, so here I am. I've been living in America for uh, two and a half, almost three years now. And, you know, I knew that I had to keep continue to share my story. And that's, you know, where I am now. And I, I've written this book, Defiant, in the hope that uh, people can hear my message and also uh, see, you know, th I, I consider myself a mirror, um, that people can see their own potential Indeed. and their own defiant human spirit. Indeed, indeed. And I think the, the right person ha has indeed listened this far. They have indeed um, heard your, your message today. And I, I just want to be the first one to say thank you. Uh, for being who you are and not only being, but also being willing to go about and share it because that takes a whole extra set of courage and that's a hill unto itself and <laughs> uh, being able to, you know, share your knowledge, your insight and the wisdom that you've gained and doing so here with us today at the Cashflow Diary. Thank you so much, Jay. It's been just an absolute pleasure speaking with you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you know what time it is. It's time for you to move at the speed of instruction. What does that mean? That means go over to JanineShepard.com. Why? Because you know good and well she removed every excuse you were already thinking about. And more importantly than that, you want to know more about the story because there's more, which is amazing. Understand this, though. There are hills, but learning to love them can make an intense difference on your journey to answering the question, who am I? Ladies and gentlemen, it's been fun talking to you today. I look forward to talking to you soon. Until next time.